you know, guys, I just love doing the podcast when the market's up almost 500 points. That just makes my day. Um, and it's just remarkable, right? I mean, we had a lower inflation number as we're recording this today. Um, inflation has been coming down at a pretty healthy clip. But even last week on Friday, markets weren't doing great. It's kind of a negative day. I stopped watching the market late in the day. And then I turned on the TV at like six o'clock. It was up over 300 points. So it's just amazing how quickly these markets can move. Um, you blink and financial conditions change like that. Hey, Chris, can we set it up so Ryan never watches watches the market? Because if it goes up when he's not watching, I like that. <laughs> well, I think Ryan's Pollyannishness is finally being rewarded. Well, That's you know, right. the famous Bobism, guys, right? Uh, bull markets are yeah. more fun than bear markets. Yeah, let's just leave it at that. I'm done. Take the mic and <laughs> going home. But no, I think it's, uh, it is remarkable um, how quickly things do turn. And you know, we, we talk about this a lot on this podcast. It's just, it's just so hard to game that, right? You know, markets went down 10% from the peak in July and really bottomed out sometime at the end of October. So that's July, August, or August, September, October. That's three months. We got that all back in two weeks. <laughs> you know, the markets yeah. gained everything we lost in two weeks from three months. So it's just like, how do you time that? How do you trade that? You can't do it. Well, I think the reason it's, it's, it's so difficult to survive through these down markets, I was talking to a client of mine last week, and he had to have a tooth extracted. And I called him a week later, and he was still complaining about the tooth. And he's like, you know, this thing's been going on forever. I said, no, it's only been a week. I said, it's just because you're in pain. And that's a good metaphor for markets. It's like those stock markets, when they're down, just seem so much more painful. Rather, they, they're so much more painful when they're down. So it's a lot easier when markets are going up. Well, you know, I mean, it, and it's, it's true. And that's why investing is so emotional. Um, we don't get requests to sell unless the market's way down, right? We never get a unsolicited order to liquidate my portfolio unless the market's way down. Uh, so what happens is retail investors, they always sell more at the lowest prices, and they always buy more at the highest prices. There's probably a lot of retail investors screaming in here today. Oh, my gosh, it's up 500 points. Got fear of missing out. That's not investing. That's gambling. And you got to control your emotions. Um, that's kind of what's been going on the last uh, three years. Well, my favorite question is always from clients when the market's going down. They're like, well, who's buying this stuff? And I'm like, well, we are. <laughs> it's cheap. <laughs> Everybody fails to realize, guys, that it's an auction, right? That somebody's selling, somebody's buying. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at it in all fairness, I mean, I, I get where people start to get a little cranky, right? If you look at the S&P 500, it's pretty much been sideways for over two years. And you go back to the summer of 2021, that's where the market is today. So a sideways market is not a fun market, but Bob, I'm going to use an old Bobism. You know, never sell out of a dull market. Um, well, it hasn't been that dull, but don't don't sell out of a sideways market. Maybe is a better way to say that right now because eventually things tend to break higher, and the patient are rewarded. And I think that's what exactly what happens here is that impatience and seeing returns really haven't been that great for the last year or two years makes you want to try something different. Like how many exotic strategies do we hear about in the last couple of weeks as markets were going down that we should actually get rid of our long-term portfolio and get into because people just get antsy? Well, you know what happens is the media plays on the negative uh, aspects of the markets at all times, no matter how good it is. So I, I can't wait to see the negative headlines about having a 3.2% inflation rate down from 9% at its peak. Um, and literally, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I had... Uh, clients of mine say to me, Bob, how can things get better? I mean, it's just like everything's so bad. The glass is half empty. Um, you know, really, it can't. It can never get better. There's so many things that, that are wrong out there right now. Well, you know, it goes back to my client who had the toothache. It's like, yeah, you know, it's like you don't get a toothache that often. So of course it feels different because you're used to feeling good. The same thing with markets. You know, markets go up most of the time. You know, it's these downtimes that are more painful just simply because we're not used to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's crazy about it too is, and I keep talking about this is, but like when the market was going down, especially in October when it really got dire, the economic data was great. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it wasn't like anything really changed fundamentally, um, even though we started to believe like, or the media or whoever was presenting the negative case made you feel like things were changing. But inflation has been coming down all, you know, since last year, <laughs> you know, uh, the employment market stayed strong since last year. We knew earnings were going to go up. Uh, this quarter, next quarter, and probably the next couple quarters. So this isn't new news. There really hasn't been any real new news. All the economic data is basically coming in as expected. It's just all of a sudden sentiments change, and for, for whatever reason, 
uh, you know, the market now is starting to react to the news better than it was a couple weeks ago. It's wild. Well, the funny thing is, it's like, right, you said things were getting, were, you know, seemed so bad this October. It's funny because the market was actually a lot lower October a year ago. Well, that's right. Even when the market was down. But, you know, you see the CPI number came in because gasoline prices dropped, obviously, because oil went down. And, you know, you're scratching your head. It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, we have a, a regional war going on in the Middle East. How can oil go down? Well, what most people don't realize is the United States has pumped more oil than they've ever in the history of the country. So, you know, we're pumping more oil, even though there's been restrictions, you know, from the current regime. We're, we're pumping more oil. Um, and even though Russia and Saudi Arabia was cutting back. So it's, you know, the market's so complex. That's why anybody who thinks they can time these things or predict anything, it's got to be out of their mind. I don't know, Bob. I thought it was uh, it's how you look, not how you feel. So I'm confused. <laughs> Well, that's unfortunately that's 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 how a lot of people judge their performance, of their portfolio. How's it look? You know, but and I, how many times you guys feel at, when it was really down after three months? I have a bad feeling. I have a gut feeling that yeah, it's like really wow, that's scientific. <laughs> well, meanwhile, I mean, talk about an awesome opportunity. We were pounding the table about look at the bond market right now. You could have gotten into a tax free portfolio if you're in a high tax bracket. You were getting like seven percent. Now yields have come down a little bit. So that's opportunities missed. Uh, and the market, of course, has had a huge run. That's a, almost a 10% move in just two weeks. And it was so hard to get people to move out of cash in the last uh, week or so, or you know, two weeks ago, or the end of October, or whatever. But man, oh man, whenever it's the hardest to get in, even though it's obviously like right in front of you, this is screaming by, it gets so hard to get investors to do it. It's just so emotional. And that's why it's so hard to be a good investor. Well, think about all those people that pounded that cash into the money market fund. Um, and they're sitting there thinking, wow, I'm getting 5%. I'm in great shape. Meanwhile, the uh, 10-year treasury was at 520. Now it's at 440. That's still a good buy, right? I Municipal mean, bonds are still a good buy. But think of eventually that $6 trillion that needs to be invested for, you know, for long term suddenly going to start buying the stocks and bonds you own. It's good to be in. Oh, and by the way, the market next year is pricing in rate cuts. So that means that 5% most likely isn't going to be 5% next year. Meanwhile, you have a lot of paralysis by analysis, a lot of inertia of money just sitting there, even though we know with a lot of certainty that rates probably won't be as high next year, which means you've got to move now. You can't wait. You know, guys, I, I quoted John Templeton on my market commentary last week, and you know, it's, it's born on pessimism, grows on skepticism, right? And matures on euphoria. I've never seen so much skepticism in my life. And if that's an indicator, man, I'll tell you what, this bull market's got a long way to go. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 142, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. But if you saved over a million dollars, and you want a more hands-on approach with your wealth plan, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan. We'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal, give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We'll build you an income plan if you're looking to retire show you how to take social security, show you how to draw from your portfolio, factor in inflation, a full dynamic income plan so you don't run out of money. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo the last two years going up and down, or have you been sitting with way too much money in cash? Paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full diversified investment game plan tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, insurance product, structured product, mutual fund, we'll go through every single investment you own, do a deep dive, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you've saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And we've got a special guest on our show today, certified financial planner at Pain Capital Management, my colleague, Bob's colleague, Mr. Aaron Dessen, maybe the deepest 
most manly voice of any financial planner in the world, at least the country. Thanks for being on the show today, man. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Mom always said I had a face for radio. <laughs> Don't tell yourself, sure. You're extremely handsome, Aaron. <laughs> um, and, you know, I thought what we could talk about today is obviously the bread and butter of our firm, pain capital management, is just financial planning and really trying to correct people's behavior. <laughs> because a lot of times human nature makes us do things we shouldn't do, which is very detrimental to our financial health. Uh, you know, mainly I would call it ego. So I thought we could talk a little bit about how overconfidence and ego can really ruin your financial independence plan. Well, I'll take the first one, overconfidence and your ability to manage your own portfolio. Well, this one's kind of like tantamount to driving your car with a blindfold on. I mean, it feels great. You know, you can go as fast as you want because you don't see what's up ahead, but eventually you're going to hit something. No, I have to agree with you, Chris. I mean, overconfidence is, you know, what happens when the markets become too easy, right? And right now it's buying, buying the Magnificent 7 um, is easy, but you don't realize that you're overpaying for an asset class. And whenever an asset class gets that, not even an asset class, talking about seven stocks, whenever they get that overvalued or the, that premium of valuation, Historically, they don't do well going forward. So you get this democratization of the market where suddenly everybody's a genius. Everybody knows more than everybody else, and it's, it's, it's obvious. And when it's obvious, that's when it's dangerous. That's really a problem we see so often, right? I mean, it's so obvious. You're a genius. You just made 20%, and you're not, you're not even thinking about last year. These same stocks were on the bottom as far as an asset class performing in that year, and you kind of seen that yo-yo. Well, that's a great point. People forget how badly the Magnificent Seven did last year. And video was down like two thirds at one point. You know, it's kind of like a Ferrari, fun to drive, but then can spin out of control and uh, hit a wall. <laughs> and I think that's, that's the problem is most of us need a Volvo to get through retirement, but the seduction of building that Ferrari portfolio feels great, especially when the market's going up and we have a short-term memory, but man, oh man, when things go bad, they go really, really bad. Yeah, it, it's so indicative. One of my buddies, called me the other day and his grandson is is 13. He owns three stocks. He has $6,000. And he says, Bob, can you guide him in his purchases? And I'm like, well, you know, that's kind of like asking me to, um, as a bookie, you know, to pick the uh, NFL games for him for the rest of the year. I mean, if you go back, you know, when I first started in, in the industry, you had to buy GE. That would have been the stock I would tell every kid to buy. Then it would have been Cisco, right? It was everybody would, just Cisco was the obvious stock to earn. That hasn't gotten back to the highs it was at, you know, before it crashed. So whatever the obvious trade is, it's usually the wrong trade. The best thing any young person could do is get a broad diversified index in their portfolio and then just save like crazy. I mean, it's almost like a no-brainer that you're going to outperform the universe doing that as opposed to yeah. picking the next AI winner. Well, Bobby, a rumor has it when you started as a broker in the 70s, you kind of were like a bookie. So I guess you've come a long way. It's Congratulations. True. Yeah. Yes. Uh, get a hunch, buy a bunch. Was that the uh, old saying? <laughs> that was a pretty good strategy um, back then, right? And uh, yeah. <laughs> tell you what, yeah. you can't believe how smart I was at 21. I, knew, yeah. I, I It's amazing how, how smart I was at 21. And uh, now they had this gray hair and all that scar tissue in my stomach lining. Yeah. I didn't look so smart back then. Well, well it's amazing it too, you know, given the fact that like if we, for most of the portfolios that we run, and Aaron, you know this with all the portfolios that you and I put together for for clients and prospective clients, it's like you know when the market's going up, everyone loves all that risk in their portfolio, and then they ask you like, why don't we have more risk? But as soon as that market sells off and things go down, that overconfidence goes to underconfidence with like literally like the snap of a finger. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, talking to even some of my favorite clients, um, when the market's going up, these are very conservative people, the market's going up and they're saying, hey, why aren't we taking more risk? And you kind of have to sit down, reevaluate your goals, you know, talk about the objectives that they had when we first sat down together and say, hey, you know, we don't need to take this additional risk. Um, you know, this is this is what your plan looks like. You're in great shape. Let's not, you know, risk throwing it all away. Yeah, that's that's a really bad trait. You know, it's it's it, it's really a form of scarcity, right? When you see your neighbor making a killing in Bitcoin or in NVIDIA, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of jealousy, but it's also a little bit of scarcity. It's like, oh, there's only so much return in the world. I need a piece of that. But that's why planning, I think you, would, you have to agree, right, Aaron? Planning is so critical. It's like, why take risk if we're going to achieve your goals with certainty? You know, why throw, you know, some curveballs into your strategy? Um, and I think when you speak to people about that in a real pragmatic fashion in the context of their own plan, 
it becomes just common sense. Yeah, and that's a good segue into also talking about another thing where people are overconfident. It's like, okay, by the time I retire, I need to have a million dollars, and that will make me set for life. But you know, the, the, the problem with that, being confident in that, that dollar amount is that, one, you don't factor in things like that your spending changes, the fact that you're going to experience inflation. Um, you know, you might have kids. You might have to put somebody through college. I mean, there's so many different variables that go into what the number is. Um, yeah. You can't just pick one number out that you know out of thin air. Well, that's a great point. I think the two things that really genuinely should create confidence is sitting down and writing the numbers on your budget, factoring what you're going to spend, factoring inflation, factoring what growth you really need on your portfolio to live off of it. That should give you real confidence. Um, and I think that's where a lot of us make the mistake. We don't take the time, or people in our industry specifically don't take the time to run the numbers. They put the cart before the horse, and they just put us in all these products which have nothing to do with our goals. There's no context at all. Um, and maybe they sell it with confidence, um, but then you find out later that, whoa, you know, this portfolio is not appropriate for what I need. Uh, maybe I need to work longer, or maybe I could have taken a lot less risk than what this advisor put me into. And these are some of the bigger problems that we see when we run these analysis for people on a, really on a daily basis. Well, you know, when you're in a big booming bull market, uh, it becomes really easy. And then you start seeing articles like last 2022 is the first really down year for a balanced portfolio in, in my career. Um, and suddenly, oh, that strategy doesn't work anymore. You know, so being conservative, you know, goes out of vogue. And so what do you do? Oh, you just put it all on red, you know, at the casino. And as you say, Rye, at least you go to the casino, you get a free drink. Here you just lose your money. Yeah, exactly. Like I read like probably 50 articles over the past year that talk about the death of the 60-40 portfolio. It's like, yeah, let's throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> you know, what you forget is that that portfolio also generates income. Um, you know, it creates the ability to buy into the market when it's low. You know, there's there's so many things that these articles don't focus on. Talk about overconfidence. You know, one bad year is destroying the history of a portfolio that's done well, you know, over 100 years. <laughs> uh, well, I guess everything's going to change now after after one bad year. Well, and that's the thing, right? Investing is a discipline. It's really about doing what you don't want to do and sticking out, th uh, sticking through thick and thin with a certain strategy and everything about the financial world is about overconfidence, right? It's about hearing someone who's so certain that something's going to happen, right? This is always on TV like, oh, well, this is what inflation's really going to do. The Fed's going to hike four more times next year, and we're going to go into a huge recession, right? That's certainty. Whenever you have that kind of certainty, don't walk the other way, run the other way, because what you have to become comfortable with is we don't know what's going to happen next. That's why we file this discipline this discipline keeps us on the straight and narrow because we don't really know what's going to happen next. And I think that's the belief that a lot of people have is somebody knows what's going to happen next and nobody really does. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we have you know, U.S. household net worth the highest in history right now. A lot of money has been made in real estate. But, you know, and, and a lot of a lot of my friends think, oh, well, there's no risk in real estate. I said, what do you mean there's no risk? It's just like any other market. Only now you're using 80 percent leverage. Right. Do you guys have any accounts that are using 80 percent leverage in their balanced portfolio? Um, of course, you have good returns. But, if you know, as I always say, if you put the price of someone's home in the newspaper or you had a ticker tape in every restaurant showing the price of your homes or, you know, going across the tape, no one would own. They'd all rent. They'd be scared to death at the plunges in prices we've had, you know, over their lifetime. So markets are all the same. It's just that it's a, it's a matter of how much you pay attention to it the short-term swings or how much emotionally invested you become in those short-term swings. Yeah. It's like I, I, a couple of years ago, I had a client that wanted to sell all their risky bonds um, and just buy commercial or buy uh, rental properties, you know, which are low risk and guaranteed return. Well, you know, Moody's just put treasuries <laughs> on, a, on a credit watch. I, I think maybe we should get rid of all our treasuries and our CDs while we're at it too. You know, they, they got to be unsafe. <laughs> you know, Bob, you make a good point. I don't know why we don't have more uh, clients with 80% leverage in their portfolios. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, it's illegal. Uh, <laughs> no, risk, no risk, no reward, right, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing how much leverage is used in, in, in other investments. And, um, you know, you got to put it in the context uh, of the history of the markets. And there's never been a greater wealth creator than the equity markets. Um, unfortunately, when it gets too easy, you know, and, and that's 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 when it becomes most risky. Yeah, and I think it's it comes down to two. Most of us don't understand what we own. We think we do, and some of these products, these financial products, are very complicated, right? We spend so much of our day going through people's portfolios, doing a deep dive, and trying to understand how a lot of these products work. Like the big banks love to sell these structured products that are so complicated, 
And once you get through a couple pages of prospectus, you're like, why would anyone ever own one of these? Because <laughs> the pitch is so good. It's like you get all the upside of the market, very little downside. And it sounds amazing. But when you start looking at the fine print and how these things are actually structured, it's pretty freaking scary. And it's like almost unconscionable that anyone could sell one of these. But, you know, as someone who doesn't know uh, better, you know, it sounds like a great investment. But until you start looking at the prospectus and going through it, you don't really understand how detrimental, and how dangerous a lot of these investments can be. Yeah. And going back to those leverage funds, um, you know, I had a client a couple of years ago show me one of those funds and how well it was doing, how much better than our portfolio was doing. And we went, looked, and it was three times leveraged. And then I went back and showed him what happened to it back in 2008, back during the dot-com bubble. And he's like, well, why did it go down so much? Well, you had leverage in it and you didn't know that. Yeah. That leverage cuts both ways, right, Chris? But, you know, That's you right. talk about structured products, right, that the, the brokerage firms sell. What about these annuities? Talk about complexity. We have an expert in annuities, right, working for us, Angelique. She's unbelievable. She just analyzed these annuities for an attorney friend of mine. And they're so complex. It, she listed like 30 different points on each one. And I said, well, what happens if this happens? Oh, well, we got to check this contract, uh, you know, point. And it's, you got to call the insurance company because it's so complex. Even when you have the prospectus and the statement, you can't analyze these things. Um, and I doubt the salesperson you know, who jammed it down somebody's throat, knew exactly what they were selling either. You know, I had a client recently that had somebody pitch them a, a fixed index annuity and was looking at their balance portfolio and saying, oh, you, you can't be invested this way. You'll never be able to retire. Was even using these sales tactics saying, you know, he, he could only sell so many in the year. And if she didn't buy before the end of the week, you know, the product wasn't available. So sure enough, we ran the numbers. You know, what about inflation? She gets this lifetime income stream. That's great. In 20 years, that figure is cut in half. You know, it doesn't, doesn't have nearly the purchasing power, and she's looking at losing out over a million dollars over her lifetime using a strategy that way. Well, that's it, a great sales really tactic, Aaron. We're going to run out of annuities. I never heard that one before. <laughs> <laughs> Exclusivity. It's like I said, when they have the club, you know, big line out front, but nobody's inside. So, yeah, I think the bottom line here is that you just really have to understand what you own. Financial products are complicated. Markets are complicated. And you really have to make sure that you have a good understanding of what every investment is in your portfolio. And when things are going well, ask yourself, is it because my portfolio is taking too much risk or is my portfolio structured correctly with my goals where I have a Volvo, not a Ferrari? All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, the federal government ran a deficit of $1.7 trillion in its fiscal 2023 year, which ended in September, more than its entire debt load in 1985. That's pretty scary. Yeah, it is, Rob. You know, I think the one thing we don't have in Washington is fiscal discipline. Uh, and I've got to tell you, it ain't going to happen this year. It's an election year. Yeah, that's a fair point. What do politicians like to do in election year? Spend money. All right, Chris. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, which acknowledged last Saturday in its quarterly report that cash has risen to an almost unfathomable $150 billion, a figure whereby any one of the top 460 of the S&P 500 companies could be bought with Berkshire's trove of cash. That's crazy. Unbelievable. The thing that's even more shocking to me is why is Warren Buffett sitting on so much cash? Warren. This is the Pain Points of Wealth podcast calling you. Invest that money. Hey, Chris, Warren Buffett always has that much cash. <laughs> He's a cash machine. All right, Aaron. Atherton, California, located near Palo Alto, has a median sales price of nearly $7.95 million, a record high. Atherton is the most expensive U.S. zip code for the fourth year running. Wow. A lot of money was made in tech. Is what I suspect. That is wild. That's a little bit out of my price range. I wonder if uh, there were any FTX locations over in that that neighborhood. I think they did all their buying in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> Chris and I were in Palo Alto uh, back in, I guess it was like March, April, and it's just uh, it's unbelievable there. It's a whole different universe, like a whole different bubble out there when you get out of San Francisco. Pretty wild. Yeah, and incidentally, actually, the, the couple we were out there to see lived uh, not too far away from Sam Bankman-Fried's parents where he was uh, sitting on house arrest. So actually, we had to go around the block to get to their house, get around the uh, the barricade. Chris and I stopped by. We had a <laughs> vegan sandwich with them and wished them luck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, gentlemen, another great show. Aaron, thanks for joining us today, brother. Thanks for having me, guys. If you like our podcast, you love our podcasts, don't be shy. Give us a five-star rating on iTunes, please. Leave a comment, let people know how great our podcast is. If this is Spotify, you can subscribe to our channel. And if this is YouTube right now, please like our episode. You can subscribe to our channel, click that notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. Your support gives us the ability to continue doing this podcast. That's it for this week's episode 140. Pain points of wealth, stay loose, and keep an open mind.